Okay, um, these are the notes and examples for section 4.3. This is the first part of, um, sorry, I'm just checking to make sure that it's on the screen there, which it is. Uh, 4.3, uh, part one. Derivatives. of inverse functions. And we have a, um, an audience of three calculus students here. So if you hear questions in the background, um, they're coming from the, the peanut gallery, so to speak. Um, OK, first of all, um, we need to think about inverse functions um, in general. Some functions can be inverted, and some functions can't. Like, for example, um, we might ask this question about a few functions. Does this function have an inverse? What do you think? No. no. Why not? Because, because it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't over the y equals x. You could say um, it doesn't pass the horizontal line test. You could also say if we reflected it over the y equals x line, it would not be a function anymore. Um, so this would be a no. Uh, here are some things that maybe do pass. What about uh, what about that? What about the square root function? Yes. Yes. How about um, we talked about in class today? We talked about the logarithmic function. What about that? Does that have an inverse? Is that totally invertible? Yes. Yeah. Yes. It is. OK, so what we want to nail down is this. Instead of like that horizontal line test, which is a nice little um, way of doing it, what about something that's a little bit more calculus oriented? Can we have a test um, for whether something's invertible that has to do with a derivative? What's, let's go back to this one, which was not invertible. What was stopping it from being invertible? Uh, it wasn't a function anymore. After you, after you flipped it, but what's, what is it about the original function that makes it fail when you invert it? Is it because it's the same on both sides? Uh, it doesn't have to be the same on both sides. And you don't want the, you're not asking about the horizontal. I'm not asking, I don't want the horizontal line test, I want something else. Pause video, think about problem. Here's the answer. Um, the answer is, for a function to be invertible, it must only be increasing or decreasing. It cannot turn around. It's when it turns around, that's when it's, I mean, this is equivalent to the horizontal line test, right? When it turns around, that's when it fails, right? No maximum, no, no minimums. If it has a maximum or minimum, then it's not going to be invertible, okay? So um, to answer this question, does f of x have an inverse? It will, yes, if, how do we get the idea of increasing or decreasing with a derivative? What would the derivative be at a maximum or minimum, the kind of thing we're trying to avoid? With zero. The derivative would be zero. So we don't want the derivative ever to change sign. We don't want the function ever to go from like increasing to decreasing, or from, uh, what did I say, increase, or from decreasing to increasing. No maximums, no minimums. So if f prime of x never changes sign. Always positive or always negative. This is how you can tell if a function is truly invertible. 
look at its derivative. If the derivative is always positive or always negative, then you've got an invertible function. Okay? Now let's actually talk about derivatives of these. Or we, uh, well, I guess we could do a quick example first. Example is f of x is equal to, um, let's see, x cubed plus x invertible. We could graph it and look at the graph, but how do we do it using the logic that we just used here? Find the derivative. Find the derivative. 3x squared plus 1. Um, and then find any zeros. See if there are any zeros and if it ever switches signs, right? So um, does this have any zeros? Yes. No. Uh, it doesn't, right? Because x squared, I mean, setting it equal to 0, you get 3x squared plus 1 equals 0. 3x squared equals negative 1. x squared is equal to negative 1 third. And that's not uh, going to give us any real solutions, right? We don't want any highs here. So um, this, think about it graphically. This is a parabola opening upward. This is always positive, plus 1. This is always positive. This is a function whose derivative is always positive. So is this an invertible? Yes. yes, it is. So we say, yes, f prime of x exists. In this case, we could find it. We could actually, um, you know, do the x y swap. And oh uh, well, what are we do for that one? Well, you could try. You know, you find the inverse. You swap the x and the y, and so on. You could try that. But all we're interested in doing here is just saying, does it have an inverse or not? Okay. So that's an example of how you would actually do that. If you find that it has zeros and it goes from positive to negative, the derivative, then the answer would be no. So um, here's a function. I'll draw. It doesn't matter exactly what it looks like, but it does matter that it's invertible. Notice that this is only increasing, right? It's not going to fail the horizontal line test. Could you sketch its derivative? I mean, sorry, not its derivative. Could you, of course you could do that. Could you sketch its inverse? Yes. What does its inverse look like? How do you sketch? You flip it over the uh, y equals So pause the video for a second and see if you, could, um, you can sketch that. And we'll go ahead and do that here. Remember that visually, a function and its inverse are reflections of each other in the line y equals x. So. Something like that. This is f inverse of x. And remember, that's how we write the inverse with a little negative 1. OK? Now, let's consider some point on this function. I'll call this the point a, comma, f of a. Is there a point on the derivative, sorry, I keep saying derivative, is there a point on the inverse that corresponds to this point? There's one particular point on the inverse that goes with this point. It's like the inversion of this point. What are we inverting when we invert functions? What are we switching? Excellent the x and the y. So there's a point here. This was the point, like, I don't know, negative whatever, positive that. And now if you switch those and do positive whatever, negative that, you're going to get to a point here that is, what would the coordinates of that point be? f of a, a. f of a comma a, right? Because that's what we're inverting. That's what we call it an inverse. We're switching the x and the y. Now, I want you to try to make an observation here 
about the derivatives here. Look at the tangent line there. Look at the tangent line here. And tell me what you think the relationship is between those two slopes. They're like the asymptote type things that we use. Mm. Will the curves like go in? What about the value? What if I told you this has a slope of one third? If this had a slope of one third, what would this be? Three. Three. They're not negative reciprocals, yeah. they're just reciprocals. Yeah. If this had a slope of one third, this would have a slope of three. If you want a justification, we're not going to have like a formal proof of this. Think about it this way. Since we're switching x's and y's, wouldn't rise over run become run over rise? Since we're switching x's and y's, wouldn't those just flip? Um, and that is true. So here's a fact about functions and um, their inverses. That f prime of a is equal to 1 over f inverse. And the unfortunate thing about this is, oh, sorry, and I plugged the wrong number in here. Because what are we actually plugging into this? f of a. f of a, right? This notation gets really, really awkward because we need to put an inverse and a derivative thing on the same function. So sometimes it's done like that. And so this is a, uh, like, this is always going to be? I, I think that this is really not a very nice formula to memorize. I think the relationship that you want to memorize is that the slopes are upside down of each other when you look at a point and its corresponding point on the inverse. You want to memorize that? That's not going to be that helpful, OK? Um, and that's basically the idea. Um, let me, let's do a couple of uh, examples. So um, let's let f of x be equal to x cubed plus x minus 1. <clears throat> and uh, say we want to find the, the derivative, no, sorry, f inverse. We want to find the derivative of the inverse function at 1. Okay? We're not going to do algebra 2 style. We're not going to do the xy thing and actually try to find the inverse. We're not going to do that. This one you can't, right? You wouldn't be able to do it. Um, here's the first thing we need to do. This is a point on the inverse. On the inverse, we're interested in the derivative at the point 1 comma something, right? Now, if there's a point on the inverse, 1 comma something, what is the corresponding point over here? Something comma 1. Something comma 1. OK? I'm going to tell you a little secret now about every problem that you're ever going to see of this type. The something here is always going to be some nice number in between negative 3 and positive 3. Because what do we need to do now? I need to know what this number is. So, I mean, you could set this equal to 1 and you can try to solve it. But I'm telling you right now, it's always going to be a number that with a very little bit of snooping around, you should be able to find. What's the number that when I plug it in here, I get 1? One. Start from zero and work your way out. Yeah, it's, it turns out to be one. You try zero, zero plus zero minus one, that wouldn't give you that, right? But if you plug in the number one, one cubed plus one is two minus one, that's the right number. One is the number that you plug in here that will get you that one. Okay? How are you getting that? I'm telling you, this is one place where guessing and checking is going to be the method that we use. 
things, right? Try a few numbers, snoop around. It's going to be some, you're not going to have to look very far, between negative 3 and positive 3. Um, and now what do we do? Now we say, well, the derivative of this function is 3x squared plus 1, right? So the derivative at 1, and I'm sorry I picked an example that has 1 as both coordinates, but it's this 1, right? That's the x coordinate on our original function. What's f prime of 1? 4. 4. And now we go back over to here. So that means that f inverse the derivative of this is, if this is 4 over here, then this is one fourth. One fourth. It flips over. Okay. Let's do one more example of that. I'll try to pick one where the two numbers don't come out to be the same. Maybe make it a little bit more clear. So let's try this. Um, if f of x is equal to Say, and we want to find the derivative of the inverse function at. We're not actually going to try to find the inverse. We're just going to use the same logic that we um, that we applied here a minute ago. Okay, so we're talking about a point here on the inverse, three comma something. That means that there was a point over here, something comma three, right? That's what inverses do. And now, you have to look. This is slightly different than the last one. We're looking for nice numbers, but we're looking for nice numbers with trig functions this time. So can you think of something that we could plug in here that would get this to be equal to 1, so that when we added 2, I got 3? Pi over 2. Pi over 2. <clears throat> right? We had to find that value. Now, what's the derivative of this function? Cosine x. Cosine x. 2 goes away. And what's the derivative at pi over 2? 0. <laughs> 0. What an unfortunate example this is. So what happens when you flip 0 over? You get undefined. It's undefined, right? So it means there's no inverse? It means that it got horizontal, it got a vertical there. Uh, it got vertical there. And if we kept going, it probably would turn around and would fail the vertical line test. So wonderful example, but you get the process here. So the oops, here we have the three on this side, right? Uh, of three is undefined. That should be derivative, right? Yep, thank you. That's why I keep you guys around. And that's about 20 minutes. So I think that's enough. All the examples that you're going to try are very, very similar to this. Okay?